where the South Pacific washes the New Zealand coast, the province of Canterbury begins. It ends with the long chain of the Southern Alps lying parallel to the coast, 70 miles inland. In between lie the plains and downlands stretching for over 200 miles with their farms and their towns. It was shore and plain and mountains that the English settlers saw when they came to found this New Zealand province just 100 years ago. To mark the 100th anniversary of their forefathers coming, their descendants are reenacting the province's founding history. This way came the Southern Hemisphere's Canterbury Pilgrims climbing up from the port after their voyage halfway round the world. They'd left their homes in England to build new homes in a new land. It was not haphazard adventure, but planned colonization. And carefully picked from all ranks of English life, these were the model settlers for the model colony. Whether capitalist or artisan, squire or labourer, life in Canterbury began in a V hut. To reenact this episode of colonial history is to realise what the pioneers had to cope with. After the V-huts came the small thatched cottages. For the labourers and tradesmen, they became the family homes. But for the well-to-do, these were temporary residences. The colony prospered, and the wealthy built homes more befitting what they were pleased to call their station in life. Those were the days of large families and regular church going. Today's churchgoers owe much to the past. The Church of England founded the Canterbury settlement and made Christchurch the cathedral city. The cathedral and the parish churches were built on the English pattern. The early settlers revered, loved and sadly missed the places they'd left behind them. So to a country that was raw and rough, they tried to bring the orderliness of their homeland. What they started, their descendants cherish. And today, the city of Christchurch takes pride in its English origins. The pioneers brought with them not only England's customs and building designs, but its trees and flowers. With these, they added another touch of home to the southern hemisphere. Cricket on tree-rimmed playing fields that might be in England completes the dream of the founders. Yet for all their planning, Christchurch is essentially a New Zealand city bearing all the marks of rapid development. As main commercial and shopping centre, this city of 160,000 people is important to all the province. Banks, shops and warehouses handle its trade, serving the great farming area that lies around it.
Christchurch is known for its flatness and its long straight streets. Here it contrasts with its port of Littleton, perched on the side of the Port Hills. Early morning begins with the arrival of the ferry steamer from the North Island. This sea route between the two islands of New Zealand brings visitors to Canterbury and Canterbury people home. Home may be far away beneath the mountains or near at hand in the centre of the city. Or home may be in the suburbs of Christchurch. Here are third and fourth generation New Zealanders taking pleasure in their neat gardens and comfortable wooden houses. This so typical of life in this country is what has been achieved in a hundred years. For these fortunate people, there is little resemblance to a home in a V hut. Children are fortunate too, for this is one of the best places in the world to grow up in. Food in plenty and good education is their heritage, along with abundant fresh air and sunshine. Fresh air and sunshine are taken for granted in the long weekends of the summer months. The dry nor'westers bring warmth to Canterbury to the joy of all lovers of summer sports. Another recreation is racing. Followers of both trotters and gallopers can back their fancies in Christchurch. The early settlers brought the English love of racing and held a meeting to celebrate the first anniversary of their landing. Ninety years later, Christchurch has become the New Zealand home of trotting, where it rivals galloping in both popularity and prize money. The crowds with money to spend, the stands, and the thoroughbreds racing round the track are a measure of the province's prosperity. Wealth that comes from its farming and its industry. Most of the industry is centred around Christchurch. Her first factories sprang from farming, either drawing their raw materials from the land or supplying its requirements. With the years, their numbers and variety increased. Now they supply not only Canterbury's needs, but the rest of New Zealand as well. People of the other nine provinces use clothes and furnishings made in Christchurch. These light industries concentrate on supplying the New Zealand market. For some of their processes, factories have imported the machines and the knowledge from abroad. Others have developed from local needs. Foundries, pouring castings for agricultural machinery, are the direct descendants of the blacksmith's shop where the horseshoes were made. With mechanization, the early ties of factory and farm have been strengthened. The worker casting the roller rings and the farmer using the roller share a common prosperity. On the skill of one depends the other's progress. The hundred years have changed the land in a way the pioneers never visualized. With machines came enormous production. The change is still going on. Not so long ago, it was the hay cart and the haystack. Now the baler sweeps through the paddocks and delivers the hay in neat little parcels. Even that first herald of the mechanical age, the reaper and binder, had almost disappeared. Now the once popular thrashing mill is old fashioned and something of a curiosity. More efficient machines have replaced it. With small boys, it's still popular, even if it's thrashing grass seed instead of wheat. For all the changes, there's much that pioneers would recognize. Work in the open air and the round of jobs governed by the seasons.
the wind and the wheat would be a familiar sight to the pioneers, but not a tulip farm. No time had they for such luxuries. People are more wealthy now. The farmer's wife of today gets her daily bread and her daily paper from the mailbox. Nowadays, her way of living and the house she lives in are not very different from the town dwellers. The radio, the telephone and the motor car have almost destroyed the isolation. When the farmer stops for his traditional morning cup of tea, he no longer spells the horses. But whether teamster or mechanic, the break is welcome. Today, tractors are the mainstay of Canterbury's agriculture. Moving steadily across the paddocks, they do what the horse teams did in half the time and with half the trouble. Yet it was the horse-drawn ploughs that broke in the plains and downland. They, and men's knowledge, turned the three million acres into the country's best agricultural farms, into some of the best farms in the world. Where this chumolia grows was once a swamp. The horse teams and human ingenuity first made the wilderness flower. With the tractors, the tradition is carried on, a tradition that takes pride in working the soil and making things grow. But it was the Canterbury lamb that made its farmers famous. This innocent creature, thanks to refrigeration, brought prosperity to the province 40 years after it was founded. On New Zealand pastures, lambs are reared to feed English people. These peaceful scenes belie the efficiency of methods streamlined to produce prime lamb in record time. On special crops, the lambs are fattened. Freezing works and refrigerated chips complete the job of putting Canterbury lamb on the British dinner table. Ripe wheat in the summer sun and the header harvester moving steadily round the wheat paddocks. This on the Canterbury Plains, New Zealand's granary, is a common sight. The auto header, which cuts, thrashes and bags the wheat as it moves itself along, is the machine that has replaced the old thrashing mill. For the crops to grow, the land needs water. In dry summers, there's not enough. So irrigation canals bring water from the rivers back in the mountains. The raceman turns the water into the water races. To benefit from this government-operated scheme, farmers make a yearly contract for the supply of water. The paddocks are laid out in a series of ditches and ridges. The life-giving water is released and pours out over the sun-baked land. In summer, this water means more crops and more stock. Here is dry ground too high for the water to reach. And this, green grass and clovers ready for stock to eat. To make two blades of grass grow where one grew before has been the aim of Lincoln Agricultural College. Here, young farmers come to increase their knowledge. By its research and teaching, especially in grass growing, Lincoln College has made immense contributions to farming success. In sheep breeding, farmers have also had outstanding success. These are Corriedales, Canterbury's own breed, evolved here to meet the requirements of the Downs. From New Zealand, they've spread to other countries, notably Australia and South America, and are now the fourth largest breed in the world. They're bred for their meat, and wool.
Wool first brought the province money before the days of frozen meat and it's still one of the major exports. These are bales being loaded into a railway truck at a country siding. The small country towns with their railway stations and their garages are the shopping centres for the country people where they buy their everyday needs. The small towns are well dotted over the landscape with their English and Maori names. Fairley and Waimati, Methven and Tamuka, Amberley and Rangiora, Kayapoi, Geraldine and Ashburton. And there's the new city of Timaru, 120 miles south of Christchurch. As the manufacturing centre and port of South Canterbury, it's the second town of the province. It's also the business and entertainment centre for the surrounding country districts. Of great interest to farming people are the country shows. Salesmen buy and displaying rival types of machinery, making something near to attract a lover's idea of heaven. Sheep shearing machines are demonstrated and are appraised by experienced eyes. The numbers of pedigree stock at the smaller shows reflect the high farming standards as well as the prosperity of farmers. Everything has a practical value. Horses are more than show ring beauties. On the backcountry sheep stations, the horse will always be needed. Here, musterers are bringing sheep through the Hakataramia Pass into the Mackenzie country. You can't get far away from sheep in Canterbury, for they've always been and still are the backbone of its economy. Coming into the Mackenzie country is to see unfolding a vast mountain ring plateau. This is the high country, over 2,000 feet up and almost cut off from the rest of the province. There are many lonely miles between the homesteads of the big sheep stations and the brown tussock seems endless. The roads lead right into the southern Alps, past some of the most magnificent scenery in all New Zealand. High country life revolves round the remote station homesteads and around sheep. These are merinos, the breed the pioneers brought with them. They thrive on the sparse tussock. At shearing time, station activities move to the shearing shed. Everything is geared to getting the wool off the sheep's back in record time. Woolly sheep are chased in one end and shorn sheep tipped out the other. To keep the shearers supplied, the musterers are bringing more sheep down from the tops. For the men, the day began at 2 a.m. when they rode out to muster sheep scattered over thousands of acres. Men and dogs have collected them in tens and twenties from the ridges and gullies. And now the big mob of 3,000 is being driven down to the shed. Later, tired sheep and tired men come down to the homestead paddocks. On the other side of the valley, a bus is taking tourists and holiday makers to the hermitage at Mount Cook. This is the Alpine playground where sooner or later all Canterbury comes for a holiday. One day away from shops, factories and offices is the clear mountain air. Visitors come to climb in summer and ski in winter. This party is being led across the Great Tasman Glacier into a land of perpetual ice and snow. Here are some of the most magnificent of mountain scenery.
The great range of the Southern Alps, extending as far as the eye can see, is Canterbury's western boundary. These mountains dominate its landscapes and regulate its climate. On their peaks, Norwesters lose their moisture and sweep down on the plains as warm, dry winds. From the snowfields and the glaciers comes water for the rivers, the rivers that irrigate the farms. In the foreground is the ridge of Mount Cook, New Zealand's highest mountain, over 12,000 feet high. And here is its peak. On these mountains, men have made no impression, but on the plains, they've changed the face of the earth. This is what people have done in one brief century. They've turned the wilderness into fertile farms and built their red-roofed homes. They've also built cities and towns. This is the heritage they'll pass to their children. Canterbury is a hundred. Today, all her people, from the sea to the mountains, take pride in their province. Take pride in what's been accomplished since those resolute pioneers landed on these shores 100 years ago.